You're listening to the Station 71 podcast with your hosts, Mario, Beth, and Brian. So... This is exciting. I'm so happy that we're back this week. It feels so weird when we have like a week off, (laughs) Um, but it's really, really great to be back recording with you guys again and to start this uh, in-depth tour of Animal Kingdom, which will be our our next place to go on our in-depth tour. But as always, let's start with our news topics. Um, So first up, we have kind of an update to one of the stories that we briefly talked about last week. Stitch is returning to World of Disney, but he is no longer going to spit. Um, I think that's kind of interesting because to me, I feel like that's always been like the fun part of walking past him was catching the unsuspecting people get spit on. <laughs> um, what, are you, what do you guys feel about this? Well, according to the article, it's not been confirmed or denied whether or not he's going to start spitting again, but... Since they put him back, he has not, apparently. So maybe they just gave him a new coat of paint and are waiting to hook up the spitting mechanism, whatever it may be. (laughs) What an interesting way to word that. But yeah, I hope that that's the case, where it's like just kind of a coat of paint thing. See, I'm not sure how I feel about him spitting again, because as many times as I go to Disney Springs, I still will very haphazardly walk around around world of disney and end up being the one that gets spit on <laughs> so i'm okay with it being gone for the moment man that's like i said last time when we were talking about it that's one of my favorite pastimes is watching people <laughs> get hit <laughs> that's very true i feel the same way it's just kind of like a nice little touch and to me it's always been kind of weird and i know that this is so dumb but i've noticed that like the ground is always wet and yet people still are like wow what where did that come from (laughs) like it's only in that one spot you would kind of think that that might alert someone but yeah it never does (laughs) (laughs) or the puddle that they're about to walk through (laughs) right uh so next up we have one incredible summer is officially underway at walt disney world um this is kind of interesting have you guys seen anything about this because it's been all over my twitter news feed lately yeah it's like a bunch of different things put together yeah so they have some new characters um they have some posters going up there's a lot of like more of the incredibles dance party and stuff like that but the thing that's been like all over my my twitter feed lately is the uh poster that's hanging directly over the tomorrowland sign did you guys see that one no no there is apparently an Incredibles poster that's hanging like right on top of the archway to Tomorrowland and it looks really weird and out of place. Hmm. Um, I'll link that in the show notes, but it's just something dumb that we're all complaining about because, you know, Disney fans. <laughs> <laughs> but the cool thing in this to me is that they have so, they have Edna Mode as a, a character um, that's now out and about. I, you know, I like The Incredibles a lot, so this is really cool for me. I haven't seen The Incredibles in forever, so I really need to go back and watch it. The only thing that's really weird to me about all of this, and it was weird before The Incredibles summer thing, um, but I always thought it was weird that The Incredibles were kind of in Tomorrowland, but that goes with what I was saying a while ago about how Tomorrowland has just kind of become an IP hub. Yeah, it doesn't mm-hmm. really have an identity. Right. So, real quick, this is totally not on any news topic, um, but I I was scrolling through my Twitter feed this week, and I saw someone write a tweet that made me stop and think for a minute, and it was along the lines of, now that Disney has Fox under their belt, is there any chance that we could see Alien Encounter returned to the way that it was supposed to be with an actual xenomorph. <laughs> and I stopped and I thought about it and I was like, I don't think so. Right. But I can kind of hope for that. Yeah, that would be nice, but... Just a little side story for, for you guys. <laughs> um, 
But last up, we have, I think this is probably the most exciting of all of the news this week. Disney filed a new patent for some of their narrative systems for Star Wars Galaxy Edge. Do you want to go over this a little bit, Beth? Because you, you're kind of explaining it to us before we started recording, and I think you probably have the best grasp on this. Um, yeah, so basically what I gathered from the article was that it's kind of a an if-then setup, where if you do something, the, I guess, system picks a narrative for you based on your choices. So... Um, the article says the technology allows for the creation of a narrative by inputting data and letting the system construct the narrative. So apparently it, it gives examples, which I love the example. It says a mouse plus buys plus a hat. So I don't know why they picked a mouse buying a hat as an example, but um, based on, I guess, what path you take, it. I guess, kind of adapts to form a narrative for you. So I think that that's really interesting because it's really, you know, unlimited combinations of what you could do. Yeah, definitely. It looks like um, they're really trying to put the interactive stamp on this. And I'm, I'm really, like, I think that's going to be really cool when they actually do get it up and open. I agree. And... I was kind of talking about it with my mom, I mean, before this patent came out, just the interactive nature of Galaxy's Edge, how it's going to be. She actually brought up a really good point, is that this whole narrative that, you know, where they've said that you're going to, you know, depending on how you fly the Millennium Falcon, like, you get a different adventure, and it, like, says, hey, go to this area and do this task or whatever, this is your quest kind of thing. And my mom's like, well, that sounds like a really good way to control the crowd. I was like, oh, yeah, it's like if there's a bunch of people over here, put them on a quest over there. Actually, that's a really interesting point. I hadn't thought about it like that. Yeah, I hadn't either, and I was like, I'm going to have to bring that up on the podcast. <laughs> I'm glad you did because, like, you know that that first, you know, three, four maybe even half of a year where Galaxy's Edge is open, crowd levels are going to be through the roof. Oh, they're going to be insane. Yeah, I honestly, like, we were talking about our our next trip that we're going to end up going on, and I was like, you know, I'm kind of happy that we're going then because it's going to be before Galaxy's Edge is open. At the same time, I kind of want to go when Galaxy's Edge is open, and then I thought about it, and I was like, nope, going to wait at least a year on that one. Yeah. It's funny, I, uh... On my time hop the other day, it was the one year since Pandora opened, and I I had, like, a screenshot between me and my best friend, and I was, like, sending him updates, like, <laughs> oh my god, there's a three-hour line just to get into Pandora right now. Like, I wasn't there. I was just very interested by it. I'm like, if there's a three-hour wait to get into Pandora, imagine Star Wars. Oh, yeah, that's going to be insane. Like an IP that people actually care about. <laughs> <laughs> so, real quick, before we dive into this week's topic, I kind of want to share some little things that I found while we were on our, our little week break. Um, and I know that you guys will enjoy this, too, so I kind of wanted to share it with you guys, share it with everybody that listens. Um, but the first thing that I wanted to talk about was... Uh, Defunct Land, first of all, put out a video about the Imagination Pavilion, and that was super fascinating. So if you haven't listened, like, seen that, go check it out. I know I sent it to you guys in the group chat, but I learned a lot about that pavilion that I didn't think I needed to know. <laughs> <laughs> um, did you guys get the chance to listen to that yet? I haven't yet, but I definitely will. Defunct Land is one of my favorite YouTube channels. He's also putting out a book, too. That was the other thing I wanted to mention. Um he posted something about it on Twitter the other day. He has a like a Indiegogo kind of GoFundMe thing to launch his book, and like within the first hour, he passed his goal. So he's going to be putting out a book about the Magic Kingdom. So that's really exciting. Um, but the other thing I wanted to mention was I found a new podcast that you guys might enjoy as well if you're into stuff like that. It's called Podcast the Ride. Um, it's basically they go through like a bunch of different attractions it's not all just about disney so they do have some like universal and stuff like that 
in there too, but they have a lot of stuff about like failed parks and different things about in-depth attractions and stuff like that too. So I kind of wanted to put that out to people that listen to our show because I know that we get a lot of feedback on these in-depth tours and this might be something you want to check out. Nice. Cool. So if there's anything else you guys want to talk about before we dive into the, the topic this week, feel free. <laughs> cool yeah. so this week we are going to start our in-depth tour of animal kingdom um this one is probably not going to be as big as our magic kingdom tours just because there's a lot less to focus on i guess um but we'll see how this goes so we're gonna start first let's do overall theming i know that this isn't on our list um but i kind of like to start these tours with like a general feeling of the the park and i think with animal kingdom this is easily the most cohesively themed park oh without a doubt Mm -hmm. so i personally i think this is the the easiest one to walk around and feel like you're seamlessly transitioning from one section of the park to the next it all flows very well um even spots that you wouldn't think flow very well do uh and i'm very happy with that Mm -hmm. is there anything that you guys want to touch on with the general theming i mean it, it's incredible you know joe Rody was the imagineer that had the biggest hand in this park and he just did a fantastic job with everything and not only you know what was there when it opened but also i think preparing the park for the expansions that we've seen or at least having it set up in a way that when the expansions came they were able to you know, blend so seamlessly into the rest of the theming. Yeah, definitely. And this really is, like, a product of Joe Rody's love. Like, I don't think anyone else has touched a park in this way, Mm -hmm. or in this much depth, at least. Mm -hmm. So, let's start this tour off in the Oasis, Um, which really, to me, is always kind of a weird spot to think about because it doesn't really feel like there's much there. <laughs> um, but we first have on our list Oasis Exhibits, which I am not going to pronounce that first one. <laughs> Babby Rusa. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, Spoonbill and Giant Ant Eater. And I think there are more exhibits in this. This is just the key ones that were listed on the map. Okay. So, because I know, aren't there, is this where fl- the flamingos are, or is that Discovery Island? I, that, you know, that's the weird thing. Like we were saying about this, this park flows so well that you can forget where stuff is. That is yeah. definitely very easy to do. <laughs> so the oasis, I guess, is before you go over the bridge. Yes. And then Discovery Island starts when you cross the bridge yeah so the oasis is like really the front center outside of the gates which i guess kind of includes it does include the rainforest cafe which is technically like outside of the park sort Mm -hmm. of so i guess this includes the front area of the entrance too um but yeah this is this has always felt like a weird thing to list on the map for me yeah same Mm mm-hmm so I guess we can kind of just gloss right over that because there's really not too much to talk about besides those exhibits. But let's talk about um, Discovery Island, which is essentially the hub of Animal Kingdom. You really kind of have to walk through here, first of all, to get to any part of the park. And it connects all of the lands like the hub in Magic Kingdom would. Um, first up on this list, we have Wilderness Explorers, which I believe, Beth, you've done? Is that yes, correct? Yes, I am a senior wilderness explorer. I finished the whole book. Ooh. So it was actually pretty cool. It was my trip a year ago, to, like this month uh, would be a year. I got my last stamp and I went to the little entrance, like the starting point for wilderness explorers, which is right here in Discovery Island, and was like, hey, like I got all the, st- like I got all the badges is there's something to do now like or is it just like (laughs) the pride like the pride of a job well done kind of thing 
And she's like, well, no, you, you like you're a senior wilderness explorer now. Do you want like a little celebration or a big celebration? And I was like, a big celebration. What so, kind of question is that? I know, right? <laughs> and uh, so my best friend was with me, and she looked at him, and she was like, get your phone out and start videotaping. And I was like, oh, gosh, what's happening? And she literally, like, took me into the middle of that bridge and, like, yelled at the top of her lungs, everyone, attention, please. My friend Beth here is a senior wilderness explorer. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> and everybody walking was just, like, smiling and clapping. And it was kind of fun. And, uh, and you get, like, a big official sticker to put on your book. So Very yeah. cool. I'm a big fan of this program. <laughs> I've been wanting to do this and I it's, I just seem to forget every time when I go and like I'm, as I'm leaving most of the time, I think, oh man, I forgot to do Wilderness Explorers again. But I was wondering how long does it take to, you know, do all of them? I mean, if you were like, I'm going to dedicate this amount of time, like I'm going to go in and do it all today, you could probably do it in a day if that's all you were doing. Mm -hmm. But uh, me, I took my book back probably three years. So just I just kind of did it very casually here and there. So it took me quite a while. But if you're like really motivated to finish, I would say you could get it done in a, a couple of days if you're being casual, less casual than I was. But if you're really, really into it, you could probably get it done in a day. Okay. Well, I'd probably do it casually, but that's cool. Yeah. Yeah, that's neat that you can kind of take your time with it and do it at your own speed. Yeah, and it's super fun. Like the map like takes you to places that I probably really wouldn't have gone otherwise, like little nooks and crannies that I didn't really know about. And they'll have like a cast member hanging out there like one of the one of the times it was like the insect badge or something and it was just this like little random corner off near uh it's tough to be a bug and she had like a displays with like a tarantula and like some hissing cockroaches and like different kinds of bugs in these like terrariums and it was kind of cool and they uh have you do a little activity and you learn a lot of stuff so i'm always a fan of edutainment cool i really like that about this is that it is like educational as well as entertaining mm -hmm. so do we want to take that segue and roll it over to the next attraction on this list which is yeah. very this is probably going to be very brief but it's tough to be a bug <laughs> um this is the attraction built inside of the tree of life which has always felt like a very weird spot for it to be because it's very easy to miss if you're not looking at your map um has one of my favorite animatronics, but other than that, I do not really like this attraction. I think of it fondly because it's, I remember doing it as a kid, but, and like, and I think if you have a kid that you should go for sure, because, well, a kid that's not scared of bugs anyway, because <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it's a cute little show, but I, I don't think it has much to offer for adults other than the awesome hopper animatronic yeah the, the weird thing about this one for me has always been that and i i say this in like a a good way it's the worst of the 3d movies that are currently on disney property i think and or 3d movie attractions i but, agree with that but that's not to say that it's not bad like, that's it's bad because it's not as horrible as it could be and that's like so I don't know, that's that's like a positive way to say that it's not very good. But <laughs> like it's one of those things that you could ride it and be done with it once because it's got the gimmicky three D effects, it's got the like you know, the kitschy stuff, but really I don't know, I think the the problem that this faces is that, you know, Philhar Magic and Muppet Vision are both significantly better three D attractions. And they have that rewrite ability because of that. And this just doesn't really have it. Plus, it's kind of got those scary moments. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> that overshadows a lot of the good that this attraction has. Yeah. And, you know, 
with the theming and everything of uh, you know the the tree of life, I always felt that it was meant to be kind of basic, you know, or not not basic, but that the it's tough to be a bug theming wasn't really tied into the the tree of life, and the tree of life had its own theming for it to be you know the main theater that was at Animal Kingdom, and that I I would have thought that you know by this time as long as Animal Kingdom has been open, we would have seen more shows kind of cycled through this theater but you know here we are and we, we still have it's tough to be a bug uh-huh. and that's a weird thing too because it would be really easy for them to swap out the videos mm-hmm. but then we would lose the hopper animatronic and i think i'd be a little upset about that yeah so let's take a walk outside of it's tough to be a bug and go along some of the discovery island trails i think this is like the hidden gem of animal kingdom um i know that i mentioned this in my theming for our last superlatives episode or best and worst episode um i love the discovery island trails they're so nice to like walk along and look at like all the the carvings of the animals in the tree and just kind of take like a quiet stroll through the park in a section that does get some traffic but not as much as maybe the rest of the park Mm -hmm. yeah i i'm a big fan of any like zoo type of institution that has these really natural looking habitats for the animals it's you know it doesn't feel like they're in an exhibit it just feels like they're walking around in the woods which is pretty cool i think yeah and i think that's my favorite part of animal kingdom we also have, uh, we're moving right through Discovery Island. <laughs> um, we have the Adventurers Outpost as well, which is the Minnie and Mickey um, meet and greet area. Have you guys done this? I have not. No. I believe this is where they're in their safari outfits, but. That would make sense. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so the next one on this list would be Flame Tree Barbecue. And there's some silence. (laughs) Have you guys done this one? I'm sure that Beth has because it's all things right up her alley. (laughs) Smoked barbecue ribs, chicken, pulled pork. Yeah, that's actually what I was going to say. I was like, yeah, I don't think I've ever eaten here because I didn't, the name doesn't really give off the vegetarian friendly vibe. (laughs) I feel like I have. I don't know if I've ever eaten in the actual restaurant, but you can go to a couple locations on Animal Kingdom property and buy the the flame tree barbecue like spice rub that they put on a lot of their meat, and we use that a lot. Uh, hmm. It's very good, yeah. So. Do you really? That's mm-hmm. interesting. I didn't know that they sold that. I feel like that's something that I've I've missed. They do. Yep, they sell it. There's the one little like um, candy slash. I think they they make it like it's supposed to be like a spice market type deal, but they sell it in there. Hmm. That's really cool. That would be like a good, I was just thinking a good gift for my dad because he grills a lot. So let's jump to after that. Let's go to Tiffin's because I feel like someone in here is eating there. I have not eaten at Tiffin's, unfortunately. I haven't either. <laughs> Maybe it was Kirsten. And <laughs> I know, Kirsten, we need you. <laughs> um, I'll pull up Tiffin's menu and we can talk about that then because I've, I've heard pretty okay things about the stuff here. Um, oh, yeah. It's definitely on my list. I just have been waiting for a time where I want to spend the money. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is definitely very pricey. Um, the lowest thing on their main courses is $36, and the most expensive thing is $53. Mm. Um, I'd really like to see the portion sizes of what they give you, because that would be telling to me on how I would actually feel about this. Mm. Yeah. But I've, heard, I've heard good things. I've heard good things. Me too. There's a couple of items that you can get at Nomad Lounge that are on Tiffin's menu, if I'm not mistaken. Just, like, small, small plate kind of things. So, the first thing on their appetizers list that is the first thing I saw and totally caught my eye, and I, I don't know how I feel about this, is charred octopus. 
And I don't know how I feel about that, but <laughs> I'm sure someone out there is going to be like, oh my gosh, it's so good. Um, I'm less intrigued by the charred octopus as than I am of the squid ink aioli that comes with it. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, this whole thing is so weird because it starts as charred octopus and then it comes in as squid ink aioli. <laughs> And heck? it's got chorizo in it. <laughs> <laughs> I bet that's interesting. I'm sure. They also have a bread service and a cheese plate, it looks like. So, huh. I'm, I'm intrigued. Maybe I'll make this a stop on my next trip. Yeah, this appears to be very much so a restaurant for adventurous eaters. <laughs> um, but let's, let's go next to Nomad Lounge because you were just talking about this one. And I know that you have definitely been there, right? Oh, yes, I've spent a great deal of time at Nomad Lounge. It's one of my favorite hangouts. <laughs> the, so tell us a little bit about it. Yeah, so I just, I really like the theming. It's it's really cool. You can just, there's so much to look at because of the theming. There's all kinds of stuff, like, hanging from the ceiling and on the walls and stuff. Uh, the drinks are usually pretty good. They're very interesting combinations. It's not like a you know, standard bar kind of drinks. They have a lot of things that I haven't really seen elsewhere in Walt Disney World, which is cool. Um, but my favorite part is that they have an outside patio that you can sit on and you can just take your drink out there and sit by the river and just enjoy the atmosphere for a little while. And it's usually pretty quiet, which is nice. So if I ever am needing a drink and want a little spot to hang out, this is usually where I go if I'm in Animal Kingdom. Nice. I really want to stop there the next time I'm there. Definitely grab a drink and just, like, sit for a couple minutes. Do you have any specific drink recommendations from here? Oh. Yes, so I've had several of the drinks on the menu. My favorite is probably, it's called Jen's Tattoo. And it's a mixture of Kettle One Vodka, Watermelon, Hibiscus, and Lime Juice. And another thing that I really like about... Wait, it doesn't have gin in it? <laughs> yeah, that's no, weird. No, it's gin, like like a nickname for Jennifer. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, but another really cool thing about the drinks here is that most, if not all of the ones I've gotten, usually have some sort of interesting, like, adornment. Like, uh... The Jin's tattoo, I want to say, comes with like a hibiscus flower on it, or maybe I'm thinking of something else. But yeah, they all they have like cool little toppings. Um, there's one that's like the leaping lizard. I'm looking at the menu. It's called the leaping lizard, and they have they like stick a like a triangle of pineapple on a toothpick and then they put like cherries on either side so it looks like a little lizard face oh, i was sad. actually kind of hoping that you were going to say that there's a lizard in there <laughs> but if you really wanted that i'm sure you could just leave it out for like an hour or so and you'd attract right. a couple <laughs> yeah so it's a it's a pretty cool spot i would definitely recommend it yeah, I'm looking at the menu now, and their drinks actually sound really good, so I'm definitely going to at least try to stop here. Yeah, and like I said, there are a few small plates that you can get, and the ones that I've had, I've only had a couple, but they're they're pretty good as well. So it's a nice little spot to hang out if you just want something small and some drinks. Yeah. And you know... It's funny because I'm looking at these and they're, I mean, their prices for their small plates don't look bad at all. I'm assuming their drinks probably aren't that bad either. Um, they're comparable with, you know, other drinks on property. Okay, that's not bad. Yeah. So moving there to another restaurant, let's talk about Pizza Safari. <laughs> uh, I have a weird fondness for Pizza Safari. And their tacky uniforms. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best part of Pizza Safari. <laughs> it really is. I, uh, I actually had a friend in college who did the Disney College program, and her assignment was Pizza Safari, and she used to talk about how much she hated the costume all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I never actually got to see her in it, but just imagining it was hilarious. I feel like when you hear the name and you know how much time they spent working on this pun that the uniforms aren't going to be really high quality. 
Right. I, I feel like that's the reason why we enjoy this. Like, can we just appreciate the pun in the name? Yes. <laughs> also, I, I love tacky. Also, I want to throw it back a little bit. If you look at the menu, Pizza Fari is sponsored by Smuckers. Hmm. So, throwing it back to our sponsorship men, uh, episode. Yeah, and that makes but, sense because of the Uncrustables. Yeah. But I honestly, like, I remember eating here, but I don't remember the food here. I mean, it's basically cafeteria pizza. Ah, so most of Disney Quick Services. Yeah, but I mean, it's <laughs> it's not, you know, it's not terrible. It's not awesome yeah. pizza, but it's not too bad. Right. You know, I'm just now realizing that there's a lot of food on Discovery Island. <laughs> <laughs> and it's weird, too, because... Animal Kingdom is probably the last park I think of when I want to go somewhere to eat. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, so the only place I've ever actually eaten in Animal Kingdom is Yak and Yeti, and I feel like that's such a typical response. Like, I feel like most people have eaten there. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, now that I'm looking at this menu of Discovery Island, I'm like, wow, there's there's a ton of food here. Um, cause after that we have Creature Comforts, which is the Starbucks location. Um, I mean, to me, it's just a Starbucks. I don't know if you guys feel any differently. <laughs> um, but the cups have little Disney icons on them. Yeah. So it's different than regular Starbucks. Maybe I'm just bitter that the bakery <laughs> is now <laughs> a Starbucks. Maybe that's what it is. Yeah, I... I am kind of a Starbucks shill. I worked there for almost a year, so I, uh, I'm biased. So totally unrelated to this, I have to tell this story because it's really funny. Um, my mom just came back from Disney, and they, you know, they stayed for a week, and they, they did all this other stuff. But the one thing that she came home and was super disappointed about, mind you, she hasn't been to Disney in probably five years now um but the one thing that she had to, to talk about with me was that the bakery is no longer the main street bakery and that it's a starbucks location she was so sad and i was like mom there are so many other things to be upset about <laughs> that is kind of the one that i wish they had left alone yeah but you know it, it was gonna happen eventually right but i i really just had to tell that because it was just so funny because I asked her, I was like, How's your, how was your trip? And, you know, did you have fun? And she's like, yeah, it was okay. She's like, but I wanted to go to the Main Street Bakery. And then I found out it was a Starbucks. And I was like, oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, but after Creature Comforts, we have Terra Treats, which looks like it's got chicken wings, snacks, and gluten-friendly beer, according to the, menu, uh, the map. Hmm. Um. And then the Island Merchantile, which is the uh, African-inspired apparel and accessories Disney character store. I feel like I've been in this one. Oh, yeah. I would be surprised if you hadn't. I just don't remember buying anything. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, this I think I would say this is like the main gift shop in Animal Kingdom. Yeah. This is the one that always has the pin card outside of, and I think that's about as far as I've gone into this this store. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, but yeah, this is probably the place. This and the one that's the Garden Gate Gifts and the Oasis are probably the two big gift stores. Mm-hmm. Um, so breezing right through that. Also, Riverside Depot, which is attached to Island Merchantile. Is that correct? No, it's across from it. That's what I say. I feel like it's across, but... It is across from it, but it's attached to the Discovery Trading Company, which all three of these stores are, like, right in one big triangle. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. I never thought about that before. Yeah, like, I knew two of them were attached. I just couldn't remember which two it was. But looking at it on the map, they're in, like, we're really, like, close proximity to each other. But we can move on from there now that we've breezed through Discovery Island. Um, 
I mean, let's talk about Dino Land USA, which is Mario's where I'm favorite. just going to back out of this <laughs> right now. Uh, you know what? I'm going to say it now. I don't mind the section of Dino Land USA where a dinosaur is. Like the, the Dino Institute section is really cool, and I really love the theming there. But because we're here, I'm going to let you guys talk about Chester and Hester's and you can give the backstory again and do all that fun stuff while I sit here and read my Twitter feed for the next 20 minutes. <laughs> well, Mario, if you like the theming and the story behind the Dino Institute and Dinosaur, you have to enjoy the theming of Chester's and Hester's because it is all tied together. Mm-hmm. And I guess with that, I'll give a brief synopsis of the backstory, but... What is Dino Land USA in the Animal Kingdom is set in the uh, fictional Diggs County. <laughs> Get it? Um, and so basically the story is that um, in the 40s, there was an elder- elderly couple named Chester and Hester that owned this Sinclair gas station out in the middle of nowhere in Diggs County. Um, in 47, some amateur uh, paleontologist, I suppose, found dinosaur bones in Diggs County. And with that, a lot of scientists and researchers started swarming to the area and eventually built what is the Dino Institute. So with that, it started attracting a lot of attention. And Chester and Hester saw this and saw places like the restaurant, which got converted into Restaurantosaurus, making all this money. And they said, hey, we need to get in on that. So they, they decided to start selling knickknacks and little souvenirs out of their gas station. So eventually, they were making more money off of the souvenirs than they were out of the gas station. So they converted everything in the gas station to stop selling gas and only sell souvenirs. So over the next couple of years, they started making more and more money off of this. And they eventually decided to build a small amusement park uh, across from their gift store, which eventually evolved into Chester's and Hester's Dinorama. And that is basically what you see today and the, um, the basic backstory. But once you know that and you look at all the little details in the land, there's a lot of them where you can see where the stuff was like converted from the gas station into what became Chester's and Hester's. Yeah, that's without a doubt my favorite part is like how much detail went into this section. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, from the, the planters that are old tires and using like old license plates for different things all the license plates are awesome yeah and just the fact that they like put a fake road to like pretend like the this is the highway that people would travel down Mm -hmm. i just i think this is a very underappreciated land Uh, (laughs) i have nothing to say i you know what the thing about this is and i've said it a couple times like to me, it just feels like a parking lot. I know that that's what it's supposed to be, but to me, the roadside fair thing just is not Disney caliber of theming. Now, you know, I, I I know it does have those little things, and that's really cool, but just, I don't know. So, I wonder, I don't know how it is up there where you live, Mario, <laughs> but these little kind of tourist trap type of things are pretty prevalent in the south so i don't know if you have a bunch up there but maybe that explains me and brian's fondness for it more so than yours (laughs) because this is kind of a i don't know it's like reminiscent of childhood like i don't know if you brian have ever been to south of the border do you know what i'm talking about there's this So there's this, like, tourist trap that's on the border of North and South Carolina called South of the Border, and it's it's basically like a, like a Mexican-themed Chester and Hester's. Hmm. So every time I pass by it, I stop. I, like, I have this weird affection for tacky tourist, like I was saying, tacky things in general, but tourist traps are, I'm their, like, ideal customer because i will (laughs) definitely stop and i will buy the tacky merchandise and i will enjoy it and post it on instagram (laughs) (laughs) so i want you to know that you said south of the border and there is a 
Mexican restaurant around here called South of the Border, and I thought that's where you were going. Oh. And I was really confused. <laughs> Uh, well, that was kind of just, I was just kind of wrapping it up as, I don't know if you, uh, maybe that explains, because Brian, I'm sure you've probably seen similar things to this on various road trips and stuff, right? Oh yeah, and you know, it reminds me a lot of like seasonal fairs and stuff that are pretty popular in Georgia um, mm-hmm. that I went to a lot of growing up, you know, and it's like, y- you go into it and, and you know what you're getting into, like, you know, the the carnival games that you're really not going to, you know, like win the, the super grand prize and stuff. <laughs> and just, the, you know, it, it's this the little stereotypical games, but it's like they're fun to play. And, you know, I, I think the theming is cute and it's fun, you know, and I I know... A lot of people don't like it and it doesn't seem very Disney-esque, but, you know, I would be hard-pressed to look at a different land at Disney that has such a creative and, like, wide-reaching backstory that goes through the whole land as, you know, as Chester's and Hester's does with the rest of Dino Land. Yeah, I would definitely agree. It's just, it's so novel. I love it. So I will say that the whole seasonal carnival thing, that happens up here too, and I can appreciate it for that, but I I don't know. It's growing on me a little bit ever since we started doing this show. Like, the more you guys talk about it, the more I'm like, maybe I should give it another chance. We're converting him. uh, I don't think I'll ever be fully (laughs) converted. So... What in Chester and Hester's do you guys want to start with now that you've given us the general overview? Well, we can just go down the list. Sure, that's easy enough. Um, so we start with the Boneyard, which is that play area that's kind of like the almost the, like at the archway to Dino Land, correct? Mm-hmm. Yes. So, I mean, I'm sure none of us have experience with that. Um, oh no i've definitely been in here have you yeah it's like a fun little play area like they you know it's got a it's got stuff that you can do as an adult which is pretty unique for disney play areas but it's a cute little looks like you know a little archaeological dig site so it's it's fun for i mean it definitely be more fun for a kid but you can actually still just look around and enjoy it as an adult as well Next, we have Fossil Fun Games, which they're kind of like spread throughout Mm -hmm. Chester and Hester's. Yeah, you have the little where you like spray the target and do the race thing that way. They have a ring toss and then they have like a little whack-a-mole type deal. I know those three. I'm not sure if there's other ones, too. Yeah, I've never played any of the games here. Wow, that's weird, because I have. Oh my gosh. Um, Yeah, I mean, so when we used to go with our whole family, we would often do, like, everyone would try to ride the same ride, and at one point everyone was super into Primeval World, which we'll get to. (laughs) Um, And after a few rides on that, I just could not take it. So I would sit it out with like everyone else and play some of the games in here. And it's it's a fun way to kill time. But for me, the biggest issue that I have with this is, I mean, I've said it a couple times. I live near the shore. So carnival games and, you know, boardwalk entertainment like this are prevalent everywhere for me. So I could do this at home if I really wanted to. But it's cool. It fits the theming and it's all right, I guess. I, did, I actually don't think I won anything when I played, but maybe that's why I hate <laughs> Chester and Hester so much. Maybe that's the, the root of this whole problem. You're bitter. My wife actually won one of the, whatever the biggest one you can get at the, it's the little like ball toss one, just whatever, basically a little like hold the ball lands in, you get the prize or whatever. She ended up winning like the super grand prize, like sea serpent one on like our first trip that just me and her went to and that was gosh three years ago now 
and I think we've lived at like four different locations now. And she's brought that to each one. We still have it. And like every time we're getting packed up, it's always funny because she's like, are we keeping the sea serpent this time? And I'm like, yes, we're keeping the sea serpent. So <laughs> now that we finally have a house like that's ours, it's like solidified that we've still got the sea serpent and it's here nice. to stay. <laughs> <laughs> frame it put it in a shadow box <laughs> but we'll jump down to primeval world after that um do you guys have anything like this anywhere else near you oh yeah every year at the state fair crazy mm. mouse i was about to say yep same thing because like i've seen crazy mouse style roller coasters <laughs> even in like the six flags up here and for a while i really did like primeval world because like i said this used to be one that we would do all the time because all of the like younger kids in my family really liked this attraction now it just makes me sick and i don't know if it's like just this style of roller coaster or what i think it's really fun but it hurts <laughs> yeah it's you just make sure you get the inside seat that's the trick that's true <laughs> <laughs> I enjoy it though because it's like you know even though you know that nothing's going to happen it always feels like you're going to fall off the edge mm -hmm. yeah I, and I love going on this when you know it's the other two people in the car's first time because it oh all God. goes smoothly until the thing starts spinning and whipping around those turns and then <laughs> you know like the, the panic starts to set in <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, I I don't know. This is one that I have fond memories of, but I actually haven't ridden it. I haven't rode it in a few years. That was really weird. Um, <laughs> I haven't been on this ride in a few years, so maybe next time I go, I'll have to do it just to see if my opinions change. But the last time I rode it, I just got off of it and did not feel good. Oh, no. Um, but after that, we have Triteps. Triceratops spin, um, which is kind of like a teacup style ride, right? No, 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 no. Whoa. Dumbo. that is Dumbo. Wow, <laughs> I am like so out of touch with my Dino Land USA. Um, yeah, so another Dumbo ride. <laughs> yeah, I've never done this this one. So I mean, I've done it, but there's not much to say. <laughs> Not much to say that hasn't been said on every other episode where we've had a Dumbo clone. Um, mm -hmm. But this one does... So, I'm going to point this out. This one does have disability access labeled on it. So, okay. that's important. Yeah. Cool. And then after that, we've got my favorite attraction in Dino Land, which is Dinosaur. I... Okay, does anybody else, like, quote this this attraction like religiously because every, i do every time. single time we <laughs> so the other day we were oh my gosh i don't even remember where we were but we were walking somewhere and someone was holding a door for us and my girlfriend was like hurry up we're not gonna make it <laughs> and i looked at her and i was like we're not gonna make it uh, we're it, not gonna make it it's running yellow lights for me oh every my god me too time. <laughs> oh but this is just, I love this attraction, and it's, I don't know, it feels like super simplistic if you look at it, because it's really just a very, very dark, dark ride mm -hmm. with a lot of bumps, yeah. but I think this is, like, really well done, um, and to me, it still holds up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember riding this, well, like, right after Animal Kingdom opened, it was called Countdown to Extinction back then. Yep. And this ride put the fear of God in me as a child. <laughs> that Carnotaurus. I was like, our on-ride photo, like, you cannot see me. I'm like all the way in my dad's armpit hiding. <laughs> we have some good <laughs> photos with that thing. And I think that's that's like the best photo spot on a ride, I think. Yeah, and, you know, when you're getting on this ride with someone that's never ridden it before, you always got to put them on that side yeah mm -hmm. you know and 
I like this ride a lot. I, I do think that it's kind of starting to show its age a bit in a lot of places. Um, and I was really hoping with the refurbishment last time that it was going to be something a bit more major than it was. But not to say, I mean, I still love the ride, but this ride would, it, it is the one ride that I would love for Disney to just go through and say, we are going to just completely like overhaul and update the animatronics, but leave the ride for all intents and purposes the same as it is. And I think yeah. it would be like just superb. You know, the sad thing about that is I've seen a lot of talk about this and Indiana Jones and Disneyland. And Beth, when you go out to Disneyland, you'll have to ride Indiana Jones and tell us if they're as similar as people say. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel like if we get an update to Dinosaur because of how popular Indiana Jones is in comparison to Dinosaur and how similar they are, ours will probably end up going away. Yeah, yeah, but I just feel like that would be a lot of work to change the the theming of the land around it. Because it doesn't really... I mean, I guess it could make sense with Indiana Jones, but well, I don't know. I feel like in order to do that, they'd have to overhaul all of Dino Land. Like, right. It just makes sense to be there because it's called Dino Land USA. But how hard would it be to move out all of Dino Land, all of Chester and Hester's, and drop something else in there? Yeah, I would... I would be sad to see it go, but I do agree with you, Brian, that it's starting to show its age, especially, like, some of the animatronics that you can hear, like, the mechanisms working inside, <laughs> mm -hmm. the whooshing and clinking kind of yeah. takes, you, takes you out a little bit. So, after that, we have Restaurantosaurus, which... Does anybody want to talk about that one? I love uh, Restaurantosaurus. <laughs> Were you going to say something, Brian? Oh, I've actually never eaten here. So. I don't oh, think really? I've ever eaten here either. <laughs> oh my gosh, I love this place. So they have a black bean burger that's really good for especially uh, vegetarians. But my favorite part is the fact that they have a toppings bar, kind of like Pico's Bill. And it has vegetarian chili on it. And it's amazing. It's like, I think, I really think that this is the, like, hidden gem of Animal Kingdom. Because they have, like, a, I think they have a pretty good menu. And, like I said, the toppings bar is really where it's at. They have the, like I said, the vegetarian chili. And they have, like, salsa and guacamole. And it's like, you know, put that on your black bean burger. Mm-hmm. It's really good. Plus, their drinks are pretty good, too. They have, uh, I think it's called a Cretaceous Cooler here, if I'm not mistaken. And it's like a really good, um, like, Midori-based drink. So, mm. yeah, I would recommend it. And I actually got really lucky one time. I was eating here, and they were... Um, Donald in his safari gear was training on the like outside patio. So like no weight at all. Just got to take a picture. And that was pretty cool. So in the theming, again, going back to the whole Chester and Hester thing, the theming is really good. They have a bunch of cool little knickknacks on the walls and stuff. Maybe if I'm ever in that area and just want to swing by somewhere for something to eat, I'll stop there. Yeah. So after that, we have Dino Bite Snacks. Trill Bites? That's a bites? Trilobites, yeah. There we go. Trilobites. <laughs> wow, that's a really bad pun. <laughs> <laughs> I, gotta, I cackle because we love puns. I, know. I, gotta, I had to let that one sit for a little bit <laughs> because that's just that's a really bad pun. And then <laughs> Dino Diner, uh, which is also bordering on almost bad pun. Um, these are all kind of just like snack stations, I think, if I'm recalling correctly. Yeah, yeah. it seems really unnecessary for there to be that many. Agree. Because Dino Land's already one of the smallest lands. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
well, doesn't it fit with your theming of like roadside carnival? Because we talked about this the one yeah. time. Yeah. With Good it point. being like with McDonald's being the sponsor of this and having um, a McDonald's stand in here at one point that like when something popped up, everything kind of flocks to it just to kind of get the attention. Yeah, that's a good point. That does make sense. Wow, I just defended the theming of something I hate the theming for. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, after that we have Chester and Hester's Dinosaur Treasures. Which, like, I, there's something about this souvenir sh- stop shop that, like, <laughs> I don't know. I I know I've been in it, and I know that I've, like, walked through it, but it, to me it feels like you could probably buy all of the same stuff in the other stores that we discussed in Animal Kingdom. Yeah, I mean, I think they just have a bunch of dinosaur-related merchandise is the only thing that you probably wouldn't be able to find at other right places. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, it's, you know, it's a gift shop. Yeah, and you also have the Dino, Dino Institute shop as well, which is very similar. Mm-hmm. Let's talk about the most awaited part of this episode, because I know you two have a lot to talk about here. Oh, hang on, hang on. We got oh, one more oh, thing. Oh. We got one more thing? What did I miss? Finding Nemo. Oh, yeah, that's right. Okay. So, um, Finding Nemo the musical is technically part of Dino Land USA, so I guess we can talk about that because this feels very odd to be part of Dino Land. Yeah, it's like a segue to Dino Land, like between Dino Land and Asia. So I guess they just decided to put it on Dino Land's section of the map. So I actually think I have an explanation for this, which is very weird. Um, so I Googled... I can't remember the exact thing that I Googled, but it brought me to an article on yesterland.com about McDonald's and Dino Land. And it's got pictures of when McDonald's sponsored Dino Land, and the McDonald's logo is slapped on everything. Like the sign to Dino Land. Um, here, I'm going to send this to the, the group chat so you guys can look at this while I talk about it. Um, but everything from like the sign to the boneyard, dinosaur, the time rover, like everything. There's even a giant mcdonald's package on top of restaurantosaurus's porch um but the reason that i think that this is probably considered part of diner land is because mcdonald's probably sponsored this building as the presented by square mcdonald's logo shows in this picture um so that might be why it's still in there but it still feels really weird to be in here yeah it doesn't doesn't really fit but i guess they had to put it somewhere so, have you guys done Finding Nemo the Musical? Because I have a very big fondness for this. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's great. I love this show. I think the cool thing about this show is that... Um, actually, the cool thing about Animal Kingdom in general is it has two of my like favorite shows in the park um, between this and The Lion King. I, I mean, this probably would be my favorite of the two. But I think these live shows just prove that, like, Disney Entertainment is just top-notch. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. for those that don't know, this is, like, an actual life-sized puppet show um, and costume show, I guess, because most of the actors are in costumes. But even that doesn't do it justice. Like, this is just so incredible. Yeah, and I would really put this on par as, like, a mini Broadway show. Oh, definitely. But, yeah, the puppetry and the costuming is just absolutely incredible. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I really like that it is a condensed version, obviously, of Finding Nemo, but it basically follows the plot to it. And if you look at something kind of like uh, the Beauty and the Beast live on stage where... I feel like the plot kind of becomes this jumbled mess because they just kind of jump around and they're trying to stick the highlights in there. Obviously, uh, you know, Finding Nemo the Musical is a lot longer runtime, but it just does a really good job of of telling the story in a much better way, I think. 
Mm-hmm. So two things that I want to point out, um, because I just loaded this up on the Disney website because I wanted to see something about the songs. And to best point, um, there are 14 original songs composed by Robert Lopez, who won the Tony Award for Avenue Q, and Kirsten Anderson Lopez, who wrote the acapella musical Along the Way. So it definitely has that, that Broadway caliber songwriting behind it. Mm-hmm. Um, fun, fun fact, uh, those two are also the ones that wrote the mu- music for Coco and Frozen. Nice. Hmm. And the Book of Mormon. Well, Robert did. I don't think Kristen was, but... You would think they would credit him. No, well, maybe not. Um, but also, <laughs> Finding Nemo the Musical's soundtrack is on Spotify. <laughs> Hmm. If you ever really want to like listen to it and you're not in the parks, um, which I can say that I actually have because those songs get stuck in my head. They're so catchy. I definitely have this on my iPod. Like you said, this is one of those things that like it's definitely mini Broadway caliber. I'm surprised it's not longer than it actually is with like how good these songs are. Yeah, it's interesting. I didn't realize there were that many songs. I mean, it's what, 40 minutes? The yeah, show. Oh, there, yeah. It's pretty crazy that they packed that many songs into that. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, they're super catchy. Super catchy, super good. I would highly recommend this, and the last two times that my girlfriend and I have gone, we have not done this, so I'm going to force her to do it the next time because I really love this show. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so with that, do you guys want to transition to the next land? Yeah. Which I know you guys are super excited to talk about, but let's talk about Pandora. Yes, let's. <laughs> Where do you guys want to start with this? Because I know that there's a lot to talk about here. While it's in my head, Brian, have you noticed the smell of Pandora. In that was general. such a weird way to phrase that. <laughs> right. Have you noticed the smell? It has a really, really specific <laughs> smell that smells like jalapenos. You know, or I, something. I can't put my finger on what it is, but it definitely does. And it, you know, it smells different than the rest of Animal Kingdom. Yeah, it's really interesting how they're like they made this smell that's like not bad but it's not good either (laughs) but it's like very specific so it's like now when i smell jalapenos it makes me feel like i'm in pandora (laughs) (laughs) but that was just my little side note that's interesting and i'll have to keep an eye out for that yes Um, but as much as the smells might grab you i think that it is actually even more visually stunning than it and it is, um, what, what, smell stunning. I don't know what the... <laughs> Olfactory. <laughs> Olfactory, there we go, yes. Yeah, no, it's, this land is absolutely gorgeous and so much detail. And I love how they incorporate, like, real plants, like, mm-hmm. that look like alien plants. It's like, I didn't even know we had this many weird-looking plants in the world. <laughs> but to that note, it's also important to mention how drastically different it is between night and day. Mm-hmm. So this is definitely something that you have to go back to once during the day and once at night. Definitely. Which is which is really interesting because it takes um, Animal Kingdom from being that half-day park to really needing a full day just to explore it at two different times Mm -hmm. which i feel like maybe is what they were looking for but yeah let's definitely let's dive into the attractions here um let's talk about the first one on the list which would be navi river journey Mm. (laughs) it's a very pretty boat ride man i thought you guys were gonna have a little more to say than that (laughs) no I, i think I think that this attraction gets um, kind of ragged on a lot because it's if you ride Flight of Passage and then you ride Navi River Journey, it's very underwhelming. But the ride itself is really pretty. 
there's a bunch of really cool effects, and you have to write it to see the Shaman of Songs at the very least. Mm-hmm. So as much hate as it kind of gets thrown on it, it's really not a bad ride. I think everyone was just expecting it to be on the same level as Flight of Passage, and it's not. But definitely ride it. It's it's a it's a cool ride, but ride it first. Mm-hmm. You know, it kind of takes the theme that you're getting outside, and it kind of just blends into that because that's really what you're doing. You know, now instead of walking around and seeing all this this plant life and everything, now you're on a boat ride, experiencing pretty much the same thing. And I agree. Like, if it wasn't right next to Flight of Passage, I don't think it would get as much hate as it does right now. I think the the best explanation that I've heard of this attraction is like if you were to take Living with the Land and remove all of the like voiceover stuff and make it about Pandora. That's, yeah. Yeah, I can see that. <laughs> but I I definitely can get that this would be underwhelming. Yeah, and while I can understand the people that waited hours and hours to ride Flight of Passage, I cannot understand the people that waited hours to ride this. Mm -mm. And that's the thing. I rode it once um, at the Pass Holder Preview for Pandora, and I haven't really ridden it since just because I don't think it's worth the lines that it sees right now still. So, question. When you guys went to – because you both did the Pass Holder Preview, right? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. when you guys went, which one did you ride first? Did you ride Fli- Flight of Passage or Navi River yes. Journey? Yes, and that's okay. probably my problem, is I rode Flight of Passage first. I was not even able to ride Flight of Passage for my Pass Holder Preview. I only got to do Navi River Journey. Oh, no. And so well, what they did with mine was you got a, a slip of paper when you first walked in, and it was either basically like, they, it, it was either a, like a ticket to get on to Flight of Passage, or it was a fast pass that you would be able to use in a month for it. We ended up getting the fast pass to be used in a month. So the only one that we could do that day was Navi River Journey. Um, But I am kind of glad almost because we did force us to do Navi River Journey first. Mm -hmm. That's really interesting about the fast pass because it's like I... Like when the pass holder preview link got leaked or whatever, because I never got the email. I just happened to see it on the subreddit, like the Walt Disney World subreddit, and mm-hmm. was able to sign up. Like I, t- like I took off work for this trip. I was like, this is never gonna, this land is never gonna be this empty again. Mm-hmm. So it's like, for someone who's an annual pass holder that's not a local, I would have been pretty upset to get the month away fast pass thing yeah and i don't think they came out and really said it but from listening to some of the other people that we talked to that day i think they were having technical difficulties with the ride and i think that's why they did it because we heard a lot of people complaining about stuff seeming kind of off and like a lot of the like they were constantly like they would you know the line would be moving and then they would be down for like a long time and then the line would start moving it, it, just from talking to people it seemed like that's why they were doing that i'm not completely sure but that's really interesting like how they did these pass holder previews diff- so differently depending on when you went because at mine like you had to wait in the line to get into pandora mm-hmm. but once you were in like, there were no fast passes or papers or whatever. You just, like, I literally walked on to both rides. Hmm. So I don't know if it was just like a, like you said, maybe it was a technical difficulties kind of day or, but I heard a lot of people say that it was, uh, that they were getting paper pa- fast passes and stuff. Hmm. So maybe they were figuring out that it wasn't making people happy. Maybe. Probably. Now, the one good thing about this one that I've heard a lot about is the Shaman of Songs animatronic. Mm -hmm. Um, So if you guys want to talk a little bit about that, I mean, at least touch on it so we can get through some of that on this tour. (laughs) It's, I mean, without a doubt, the most lifelike animatronic I've ever seen before. Right. 
yeah, we kind of, you know, gushed on this with our, like, little best worst medley that we did a couple weeks ago, but it's absolutely incredible just how fluid the motions are and how realistic. Mm -hmm. It's like if you, you have to ride the ride for that purpose, it makes it worth it, I think. Cool. Now, let's talk about the one that I know you're both going to gush over. <laughs> let's talk about Flight of Passage. Yeah, man. I, I don't know if I've said it before, but when we did this for the annual pass holder previews, like, at, at the end, my best friend that, that was with me was like, is anyone else crying? <laughs> I've like, heard a lot of people say that. Mm -hmm. Like, it was really incredible. Like, it sounds so nerdy to gush like that, but it was just, like, so, I don't know, vivid and, like, immersive that it was just, like, whoa. Like, people, like, he was legit, like, he wasn't joking. Like, he was getting emotional about it, and he doesn't, he's not even a big Avatar fan. <laughs> is anybody really a big Avatar fan, wow. though? <laughs> Maybe someone out there is. <laughs> they just defended that one listener that Avatar is their favorite movie. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, this, I would say that this is probably my second favorite attraction at Walt Disney World in general, mm -hmm. which is pretty significant considering number one is Haunted Mansion. Yeah, it's basically, I think it has that, you know, start to finish theming that Haunted Mansion does, and you also get you know a very thrilling ride too with it um but yeah it's just it's so immersive it's hard to describe just how much storytelling there is throughout the whole thing and you know it, it and it starts like all the good ones that we talk about you know the theming starts well before the ride and it fits perfectly with the area but you know just the all the pre-show stuff you know, it's it's not it's stuff that's not necessary. But you know, like when you're in the room, and they're scanning you and stuff and all that. And then when you move into the next one, they're doing like your your pre you know mission briefing and everything. You know, it's it just it pulls you into the story so much. It's it's just great. I think it's again. I I'll still say just like Beth did. Haunted Mansion is my favorite ride at Disney, but you know, Flight of Passage shows that Disney can obviously still make incredible, incredible rides with great theming. Yeah, and I think the exciting thing about Flight of Passage is that they can totally, like, do they could do, like, a Star Tours with this and make different, you know, adventures that you could go on. Mm -hmm. So it's really great that they have that option to kind of make more possibilities in the future mm -hmm. right now the other thing that i have seen a lot of talk about that i i really can't wait to see for myself is that uh the avatar in the queue mm -hmm. i have heard a lot of good things about that too is that technically an animatronic or it is actually an animatronic it is not a screen projection it is it is a completely 100% like animatronic through and through. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's it's pretty incredible as well. And I like the the way that they set it up is that you can't see it until you're at it. Like you can't see it from around the corner, which I think is really nice for the you know, the build up of it cuz I mean, if you don't know that you're going to see it, then it's just kind of there and you're like, "Oh my gosh, what?" But it's also kind of nice if you do know it's there because then you're like waiting for it mm -hmm. well i have a question for you but how many times have you done flight of passage <laughs> i think it has been well i did it twice at the pass holder preview and then i've done it two on two other trips so four times total okay so you've actually done it more than i have but i've done it twice and it i've done it once through the fast pass line but the time that i went through the um just that the standby line last time they actually routed us kind of away from that and i was disappointed because you know i had to wait in the standby line 
And I really wanted to see that. I figured I'd be like, oh, here's the, the big perk of getting to wait in the standby line. But so, Oh, wow. Yeah. So hopefully, Mario, when you go, if you do standby, you'll get to get close to the animatronic. I was able to see it, but it wasn't as close as I know the line usually runs through it. The only thing that, like, I'm super afraid of, because the next trip that we're going on, it's going to be me, my girlfriend, and her parents. And I know they're going to want to do Pandora. I know that they're going to want to, like, go through this. And I'm just so afraid of the lines. Like, I know that with Toy Story Land being open in the time that we're going to be there, like, it's going to be at least a little bit lower. But, man, those weights are still super high for me. Well, the last time we did it, I was, it was me and my wife, my brother and his girlfriend. So there was a, there was a group of four of us and we did it at Rope Drop. I mean, Rope Drop is almost a must. And this was on a very crowded day, and it rope drop at Animal Kingdom. Everybody is running to get on Flight of Passage. Trust me, nobody's going anything else. But even then, it's you know it was only like a forty-five minute wait for us. And this was on a day when I saw wait times approaching four hours. So just so just know that you know if you get there, if you're willing to do rope drop, and especially if you get to take advantage of extra magic hours. You know, you can get a, a realistic weight. And to add to that, the last time I went, I was not able to get a fast pass for it because who can? Mm. And I s- still really wanted to ride it because I don't think my boyfriend had ridden it at that point, or maybe this was his second time. But regardless, I wanted to ride it again. And so we actually just waited until, like, right when rivers of light was starting and went to get in line and the like the line queue said it was like a two or two and a half hour wait but that's from what i've heard is a tactic that disney uses to try and get you to not get in those last minute lines Mm -hmm. because we ended up only waiting about 45 minutes yeah i'm wanting to say that when we had our 45 minute wait it was posted at over an hour and a half so yeah so take it with a grain of salt but that's you know if you can't do rope drop or you don't want to do rope drop that's another viable option Mm -hmm. yeah i think that's going to end up being what we're going to have to do because i know they're not going to want to rope drop it but at the same time like i know that disney does do that because i I think i told you guys that the one time i got on peter pan with a 15 minute wait it was posted at 60 minutes and that was during wishes so Mm -hmm it's definitely a good bet to try to squeeze in those rides like late at night when the the shows are going off. Yeah. And for our listeners, just one thing to keep in mind too, if you're not staying on property and you are, um, you know, trying to get to the parks early, I would highly suggest looking at when extra magic hours are. And if you're trying to get to animal kingdom to do flight of passage early, Do not do it on a day that has Animal Kingdom early extra magic hours because, trust me, the thousands of other people that got to the park for extra magic hours are now in line in front of you for Flight of Passage. So it's not going to save you much time. Yeah. That's definitely true. Um, So let's talk about the other things in Pandora real quick, because there's three other things on this list that we got to touch before we we finish this episode out. Um, We have Pangu Pangu, which do you guys have any, anything you want to say about that? Yeah, this is, so this is a little kiosk outside of uh, the actual restaurant, Satuli Canteen, and it has a very special snack that you can only get here and I've talked about it before but I can't say enough good things about it it's called the Pangu Lumpia or Lumpia and it is yes it is so delicious it's like a warm pastry version of a Dole Whip and it's so good the description says pineapple cream cheese spring roll which sounds weird but it's it's really really good and this is also where you can get the like green beer that they sell. And then they also have a Moara margarita, which is really good. So I like this place a lot. 
definitely sounds interesting. Yeah, and that's one thing that I that I really like about Pandora, kind of like I was saying with um, Nomad Lounge, is that you don't really see these offerings elsewhere. Like, obviously, you know, you can get a margarita somewhere else, but, like, as far as the food options go, like, in these two, you know, quick service establishments, it's, like, really unique meal options for you. So, after that... We have Satuli Canteen, which I know you guys have talked about on here before. Oh, it's mm-hmm. fantastic. So no. good. Our go-to used to always be Yak and Yeti, but since Pandora opened, we almost always go to Satuli Canteen now. I think it's probably the most unique and just overall tasty food that you can get for the price at Disney. Because mm-hmm. it's, you know, it, it's a quick service, it's cheap. They now have mobile ordering, which makes it even faster and easier and everything. But um, has some really cool menu options and the way it works where you get to come and pick like a protein, a base, and a sauce. It gives you a lot of options to mix it up and try different things every time you come. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to trying this one. I know that this is going to be uh, very interesting. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of the bao buns. The... Obviously, I've only had the vegetable curry ones, but they're really delicious. But just a small detail that I really love about Satuli Canteen is that they use, like, real dishes and, Mm -hmm. like, real silverware. Yes. And it's, like, actual, like, the dishes are, like, pottery. So it's, like, even more adds adds to the theme, which is pretty cool. So I I would like to see, I know that's probably not feasible, but I would like to see that in more restaurants where they use real dishes because it's like, I mean, quick service restaurants, obviously they use real dishes and table service, but it, it just makes, I don't know. There's something about the presentation that makes the meal better. Mm -hmm. And this place has very, very cool presentation, not even just, you know, the plates and the silverware, but the actual food presentation is very nice here. For sure. Yeah, definitely. From everything I've seen, I am like, I I need to go. I know that this is going to be a place that I need to stop and try at least once. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then it'll probably end up being my staple for Pandora (laughs) and Animal Uh, Kingdom. Highly recommend. So the last stop on our tour for tonight, because we are going to add the next two to the next episode, um, Wind Traders. Which, is this where you get your, uh... The Banshees. Yes, thank you. Mm Mm-hmm. Yep. This is where you get the very highly coveted souvenir. I know you have one, Beth. How do you feel about it? Like, I don't regret getting it, because it was... I was living in the moment, but it has literally sat on a shelf. Like, I used it the day I got it. And it's sat on a shelf ever since. So it's like this. The the problem to me is that if I were to take it with me into the park, I would only want to use it for like a couple of like hours. And then I would want to not have to hold on to it anymore, which is exactly what happened when I bought it. But luckily they still like they let me put it back in the box and send it to package pickup at the front of the park. So Just so that's like a little tip that I didn't know is that if you still have the original receipt, then, or a a receipt, it probably doesn't have to be original, then you can, you can still have it sent to package pickup, even if you have already walked away from the counter, like you don't have to do it right then and there. So that's what I did, which was really convenient because after, you know, having, having this thing on my shoulder for an hour or two, I was like, all right, I'm ready to not have this anymore. So, um, but yeah, I it's a really cool souvenir. I would definitely recommend it for kids. Like, it's it's really nice that they have these interactive kind of souvenirs now. But uh, but it is pretty pricey, so just keep that in mind. Uh, I be- I when I got mine, I think it was fifty dollars, but I think it's gone up to sixty now. But, um, and then there's like a perch that you have to buy 
you don't have to buy it, but if you want it on a shelf, you really have to buy it because <laughs> we don't have to buy it, but you have to buy it. <laughs> if if you're planning on keeping it in the box, you don't need to buy it. But if you're planning on having it on a shelf, then you should probably get it because it's uh it's got like magnets underneath, like the banshee itself, and then the little perch has magnets that light line up with it, so it actually like looks nice on a shelf and sits there instead of just. You know, because it's got a weird shape underneath. You can't really put it on anything other than this perch. Yeah, they definitely have a weird shape to them. I've noticed that. <laughs> but it's a cool it's a cool toy. I would recommend it maybe at the end of the day when you don't have to carry it around all day. <laughs> now, question for you. Outside of the Banshees, what else do they have here? Is there anything so, super unique yeah. about this? So they have different like t-shirts and mugs and all kinds of like pandora labeled merchandise um but the other kind of like big ticket item here is that you can have an avatar of yourself made into like uh, an action figure or like a stat like a sculpture kind of thing interesting so you, i haven't actually done this but i've seen it online and i've seen people doing it in the store is that you uh you go through this process where they take a bunch of pictures like of your face kind of I think it's like maybe a 360 kind of thing uh around your face and then you come back in a couple of hours and they have this little model avatar that's supposed to look like you and have like similar features and stuff which I think would be you know pretty cool for a collector or a kid that's really cool um I'd have to imagine that that's probably pricey though yeah I'm not sure how much but I would I would imagine that it's pretty on, pretty up there. So that actually puts us at the end of our Animal Kingdom tour for this week. Is there anything you guys want to talk about in Animal Kingdom before we tie this up? I'm going to save all of my conservation gushing for Africa and Asia because that's actually where it's at. Then that's going to do it for us this week. Thanks for joining us again on another episode of the Station 71 podcast. Be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts from. And while you're there, leave us a review as well. We'd be happy to address your questions, comments, or concerns on the show. If you want to find us on any social media, you can find us on Facebook.com backslash Station 71 pod, Twitter at Station 71 pod, Instagram at Station 71 podcast, and you can send us listener emails at Station 71 podcast at gmail.com. We hope you enjoyed your ride, and we'll see you real soon. Please stand clear of the doors. Por favor, manténganse alejado de las puertas.